no selfie to her. Well, what's left of the old neighborhood? My guys take me over to the gateway of Indian, beautiful uh, British uh, colonial monument, arch right on the harbor, Bombay Harbor. Beautiful promenade there. Uh, looks familiar. Uh, Taj Mahal Hotel itself, sure. And uh, but uh, what about the hippie stuff? Uh, Dipti's House of Pure Jinx, major hangout in Bombay. Ain't there anymore. Yeah, just a metal shuttered door. There's a big padlock on the bottom. That's it. Uh, Rex Stiffel's Hotel across the street. Hmm. Not there either. There is a hotel under a different name. Walk inside just because I'm a reporter. And uh, you got forty bucks? Yeah. Uh, you know, we used to pay a dollar to stay there and smoke hashish on these beautiful wooden balconies overlooking Diffie's House of Pure Drinks. Yeah. Oh, wow. Where'd that Salvation Army on the corner come from? Never saw that before. It's got a good reputation. I go inside, talk to the managers. Yeah. Good deal for travelers. Uh, you know, safety deposit boxes and stuff. A decent price. Yeah. So, uh, what is left of the actual hippie uh, scene? Nothing. It's gone. Hmm. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, I could use some goodness. Oh, what would cheer me up? Hmm. Oh, wait a minute. The Taj is open again. Let me go over there to their bookstore. Oh, yeah, world-class bookstore. And uh, all kind of newspapers and books and postcards. And, oh, uh, as I'm, you know, going to go in, got to go through a metal detector. Mm. And, oh, they searched my handbag, too. I mean, 30 guests of their hotel have just been murdered in cold blood. Swimming pool, blood red. But inside, mmm, kind of a paradise. Aromatic, huge bouquets of orchids and all kind of tropical flowers. Just like overwhelms you when you get into the lobby. In the bookstore, oh yeah, I just luxuriate in there. Go through all the old postcards and uh, anything over 95 years old is copyright free in the public domain. So score a bunch of those. Ones in the book, uh, Taj Mahal Hotel, 1903. They stamp them. They were real postcards with real stamps. So if it says 1903, I can use it. Ooh, uh, yeah, the newspapers are my favorite. The International Herald Tribune, published in Paris, out of New York too, and get that and other newspapers from around the world. Ooh, I'm cheered up. <laughs> well, back down in the street, just a couple blocks away, uh, I go to the uh, agency uh, called Reality Tours that does tours, sensitive tours, to the, the Rafi slums. So I go in there and, what? <laughs> I've got to go up these stairs. Well, can you really call them stairs? Uh, it's kind of like going up in the yellow submarine a couple of levels because you can bop up. Uh, to their office. Oh, they do have a desk, and uh, there's a cheerful uh, young uh, Indian boys uh, run the place, and uh, they explain the situation. No photography at all, and uh, oh, who's with me on this tour? Oh, four other Westerners, so five Westerners uh, in the back, and the two cheerful fun guys in the front. So off we go. Uh, first, uh, they drive through the red light district. I mean, it's been world famous for centuries. And I've had some fantasies about that. Yeah. And uh, on to the world's biggest laundry. Miles and miles of people like uh, uh, slapping clothes against concrete, dying vats, uh, whew. thousands of people doing laundry. I mean, for Taj Mahal Hotel, just to name one. And uh, then we get to the slum itself that's jammed between two railway stations. 
I mean, two rail tracks that go off at an angle. They're in like a pie wedge, a huge pie wedge. I mean, like one train goes up to uh, Agra, another one's headed the other way. They're wedged in there. And uh, our guides guide us in there, park the van, and, and, and in we go. And the first thing they do is take us up to the roof of an abandoned uh, building. And uh, so we can get uh, the overview. And uh, what strikes me is the absolute lack of color. It's a gray world. And the sheer immensity of the slum. <sighs> Yeah. Mm. Well, how do these people survive? I mean, they got to, you know, produce some energy, eat. Uh, how how do they do it? Uh, well, good. The guides explained that the Duravi slum is the recycling center for 16 million people. They recycle everything. Scraps of plastic don't, you know, they. They reduce plastic to little plastic pellets that can be remolded into other plastic items. And oh, there's a child in a in a cubicle, and he's probably twelve, and he's exclusively undenting the caps of whiskey bottles. I mean it's that detailed what they recycle. They even take old paint cans and somehow heat them up, melt the paint off the outside, reuse them, tap them out. And uh, and then big name brands buy stuff in uh, Duravi slumps like Gucci leather, Gucci bags. They buy uh, leather from the tanneries within the slumps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then we walk past, uh, you know, they have streets. I mean, they have like 10,000 people who make take uh, clay pots, you know. These people came in from Gujarat centuries ago, generations ago. And uh, just that uh, guild is 10,000 of them doing that. And uh, they, they, they actually rent room, uh, little apartments there to other slum dwellers. Well, I asked the boys about that. Yeah, he says, oh, yeah, they're expensive. They're like $80 a month. I, forgot. I seriously consider moving in. $80 a month? Well, um, I'd have plenty of friends. And, uh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm file that away. If I ever disappear, uh, yeah, check out the Duravi slums. I'll be up there. I'll make a studio, an uh, art studio there. Yeah. Uh, they're all earth people. They're all my brothers and sisters. Nothing to be afraid about. They're earth people trying to get through the day. Just like me. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, guys. When we get to the very end, we're going to get picked up in another minivan. Uh, we end up in a little classroom where uh, Westerners are teaching the slum dwellers English. They're a non-governmental organization, an NGO. <laughs> and the reality tours gives half the price of the tour ticket to these folks. See how the circular kindness is going around. Yeah, what did the tour cost? Hundred rupees or ten dollars. So. Well, I get back to my neighborhood in Bombay and get back to that Bentley Hotel. It's so comfortable and uh, sink into the pillows. <gasps> All my tri uh, emotions totally triggered off by this visit to the Duravi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sadness. For the extreme rich 
poor divide in our present human condition. Why do these slums even exist? You know, hope. I mean, there's a lot of happiness. People are laughing and joking and learning English and producing goods and recycling stuff. I mean, it's not doom and gloom. They're, they're getting through the day with all that smog on top of them. Huh? Uh, inspirational, you know, for the human grit to survive. Well... Deep gratitude for my own parents and how they raised me. Yeah. And nothing is wasted from these slum dwellers. Absolutely nothing. Recycling experts. Yeah. Well, you know, last thing to do in India. Walk over to the Cafe Leopold uh, since 1872. Walk over there with my camera and notepad and uh, interview the surviving waiters and manager. Mm -hmm. Well, the waiters, uh, they show me around all the bullet holes everywhere. Why? Because these two Pakistani terrorists split off from the uh, eight, eight member commando team two went to the victoria station train station and uh, just massacred people getting off the trains with automatic weapons they went over to a jewish center also two guys terrorized that killed a bunch of israelis over there and but then they all kind of regrouped at the taj and they just just held off the whole world for like a week I mean, India, you got four billion people and you got eight eight terrorists. Can't you just do what you need to do and shut that down right away? Throwing hand grenades over the balcony? Indian gawkers? <laughs> Better watch you out, huh? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Ironically, the waiter shows me the sign. Oh, riddled with bullet holes. What does the sign say? We reserve the right of admission. Mm. Well, I interview the cafe manager. He's on kind of this raised uh, 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 platform, desk, seeing so he can overlook the waiters and, uh, you know, kind of keep things going from an elevated distance. There's a jar on the, uh, next to him, a uh, uh, donation jar for victims. Yeah. Well, he explains, you know, the devastation of the children. Two of his waiters were, were massacred. One had only worked there for three weeks before he was gunned to death. Yeah. Well, I stuff a, a bank note into the donation, John. Go over to a table and... Overcome with grief. I slump my head on the table. Yeah, I feel tears flashing on the menu. Waiter slides a cappuccino on my table. Profound pain haunts Cafe Leopold. Mm. For the first time in my extremely sheltered life, I... Uh, feel to my bone the nature of murder. Being alive in a human body, so brief and fragile anyway. What a, what a divine million-year-old miracle our bodies are. Mm -hmm. To destroy uh, this great mystery is the profoundest, purest evil. I'm shaking. Absolutely unprofessional anymore. Forget about the story. Hey! 
where where's the good old-fashioned peace and love? I mean, we hippies courageously uh, went overland from Istanbul to Kathmandu and Goa. As a 20-year-old, I myself, uh, you know, hung out with peasants in Greece. I lived in a cave there and uh, traveled overland and really enjoyed the Turks. Wonderful people and culture. Uh, went into Iraq from there, had a amazing experiences uh, hitchhiking oil tanker trucks into Baghdad. Cost Americans $2 billion, shock and awe, to get into Baghdad. Cost me sticking my thumb out, being a kind, common human being like the truck driver. I mean, yeah, Syria, Aleppo. I mean, Aleppo rings off all the wrong stuff now. The siege, the massacre of Aleppo, ISIS. Yeah, there's a better ones along that road. You know, saved me from sunstroke, took me off the road, gave me yogurts, water, for free. I just, just you know, kind humans being kind to other humans. Uh, that's that's the uh, essence of what you learn. Iran, wonderful people there. Lovely Iranians, yeah. Special heart, special place in my heart for the Iranian people. Got lost in sand dunes down uh, outside of Bandar Abbas. I would have died. Persian sheik saved my life. We hippies, we, we cherished our authentic bonding and friendships with uh, earth people. That's how I became an earth man. That's how I got my nickname. I, uh, I transcended anything except that. You, you don't need, life doesn't need to be complicated. You're a human being, leave it at that. And the uh, natives uh, along the way, they were inspired and moved and touched in their heart by us and by the way we live. Like we lived with the rickshaw drivers in Benares. So we would uh, sleep in their uh, rickshaw seats. So we crashed on the floors of uh, Francis Rodriguez's house and the locals, they just couldn't get enough of that. The opposite of colonial overlords you know, exploiting them as subhuman people. Here come the hippies, like, yeah, hey, we're all on the same earth job. What's up? You know, that's where we're coming from. And that's where I'm still coming from. You know, when you become an earth person, you just go, ah. <sighs> And you realize that all of that intolerance, you know, putting down this person, putting, oh, oh, you're transgender, fuck you. What? Or what? You're, you're Iranian, you must be a terrorist. What? Get rid of all that garbage, psychic junk. And if you do it long enough, I've been doing that for 50 years, you have this kind of protective shield. This, these bullshit thoughts just never even get into your atmosphere. They're cut off way before they can even, uh, you know. Uh, and it, it makes your life really happy because there's only really uh, brothers and sisters everywhere. Everywhere. And... Uh, it doesn't matter whether they realize that or not. If you do, I mean, they don't see you maybe as an earth person. They might put me down as a, as a psychotic bum and a, and, a, and a fucked up old hippie. That's their trip. My trip is, yeah, okay, say that to me, but you are me. So I feel compassion for you because your awareness is so stunted. Yeah. Uh, you know, 300,000 of us came overland and we learned what? We're human beings. All of us. It's that simple. 